Hello, everyone. Great to meet you virtually here at Informs 2020. My name is Yan Huan. I'm an assistant professor at Tepper School of Business, Carnegie Mellon University. In this tutorial, I'm going to introduce you to the emerging topic of artificial intelligence and algorithm bias. This tutorial chapter is a joint work with a PhD student, Ren Shan, and my colleague, Paran, both at Carnegie Mellon University. Artificial intelligence and machine learning have been increasingly used to make important decisions. For example, employers use machine learning algorithms to screen job applications. Banks use machine learning tools to assess individual credit worthiness and make loan approval decisions. Doctors use machine learning algorithms to guide their medical decision making. Initially, people thought that machine learning algorithms have the potential to help reduce bias and discrimination in humans' decisions because they thought that algorithms can be designed to be neutral and objective, for example, by not including the sensitive features such as race and gender as input features. Here is a more concrete example. This is a New York Times article by Claire Miller. The title is, Can an Algorithm Hire Better Than Human? And this article was published in June uh, 2015. Here is a direct quote from the article. Let's pay attention to the sentence in bold. It says that the software relies on data to surface candidates from a wide variety of places and match their skills to the job requirements free of human biases. So we can see that people initially believed, at least this author believed, that machines can be free of human biases. However, two weeks later, the same author published another article, also on the New York Times, about algorithmic discrimination. And this is a quote from the second article. It says that there is a widespread belief that software and algorithms that rely on data are objective. But software is not free of human influence. Algorithms are written and maintained by people, and machine learning algorithms adjust what they do based on people's behavior. As a result, algorithms can reinforce human prejudices. Indeed, more and more evidence of algorithmic bias has been reported. One high-profile example is related to Compass. Compass is an algorithm used for recidivism prediction. ProPublica published an article titled Machine Bias. It shows that Compass was biased against black defendants based on data from a county in Florida. For example, about 45% of black defendants were labeled high-risk but did not reoffend. But this error rate was only about 23-24% for white defendants. In addition, about 28% of black defendants were labeled low risk but did reoffend. But this error rate was as high as about 48% for white defendants. In other words, low risk black defendants were almost twice as likely as their white counterparts to be mistakenly labeled high risk and high-risk white defendants were almost twice as likely as their black counterparts to be mistakenly labeled low-risk. The next example is in the context of personal finance. David Hansen, the creator of Ruby on Rails, which is a popular open-source web framework, posted on Twitter that Apple Car declined his wife's request to increase the credit line but gave him a credit line 20 times higher, despite the fact that he and his wife file joint tax returns, live in a community property state, and have been married for a long time. He claimed that one Apple representative responded, I swear we're not discriminating, it's just the algorithm. Another example is the Gender Shades project which evaluated the performance of commercial gender classification algorithms, including three products produced by Microsoft, IBM, and Face++, respectively. The results showed that all three classifiers performed significantly worse on darker females. 
As people see more and more such stories, they become increasingly concerned about algorithm bias. Academic researchers start to make attempts to understand and resolve the issue of algorithm bias. The majority of fair machine learning research considers the technical aspect of algorithm bias. Machine learning researchers propose various definitions of algorithm fairness, techniques for detecting algorithm bias, uh, methods to remove or reduce algorithm bias in a mathematical or statistical sense. And on the basis of these works, practitioners have also developed some convenient tools that help detect and mitigate algorithm bias, such as Microsoft's Fair Learn Python package. In technical research of fair machine learning, algorithms are often examined in isolation with humans from whom they learn and to whom they are applied. However, in reality, imposing algorithm fairness will likely change the incentives of agents who use machine learning algorithms or those who are subject to these algorithms. As a result, agents will strategically react to the fairness notions imposed. And more importantly, these questions about how agents react to fairness requirements are particularly relevant to policymakers. Therefore, there is also a growing literature that examines the social aspect of fair machine learning. In this presentation, we'll touch on both the technical and social aspects. Specifically, in the rest of the presentation, I will first discuss the various fairness notions that policymakers, practitioners, and academic researchers have used or proposed. Then I'll discuss challenges in algorithm bias identification and detection, explain the potential sources of algorithm bias, and review several bias correction methods. And finally, we'll discuss the social and economic implications of fair machine learning. To facilitate the explanation of some technical terms, I'm going to introduce a simple loan granting example. Suppose a bank uses a machine learning algorithm to make loan approval decisions. The machine learning algorithm predicts whether each applicant will repay the loan and the bank will only grant loans to those who are predicted to repay. The algorithm uses a set of features X to predict the probability of repayment. These do not include the sensitive features. For simplicity, we assume there is only one sensitive feature, gender, which is denoted as A. A takes the value of 0 or 1, with 1 representing female and 0 representing male. S is the score the algorithm produces, which can be a function of both X and A. The value of S is between 0 and 1, and this could be, for example, the predicted probability of repayment. The decision L is a binary decision, whether to grant a loan to an applicant. The decision is based on the score S and the gender A. Y represents the actual performance of a loan. Y equaling 1 means the applicant will repay the loan, and Y equaling 0 means the applicant will eventually default. Note that here, for notational simplicity, I do not include a subscript, but each applicant will have uh, his or her own set of XY values. The set of applicants is denoted as V. Before analyzing and resolving the algorithm bias problem, we need to first define fairness in the context of uh, machine learning algorithms. A number of fairness notions have been proposed to accommodate different scenarios and equality goals. Before we get into the details of each of the fairness notions, I would like to quickly mention the two doctrines of discrimination that current legislation recognizes. They are disparate treatment and disparate impact. Disparate treatment is about procedural discrimination. It refers to disparate treatment of similar people from different classes based on gender, race, or other sensitive attributes. On the other hand, Disparate impact addresses outcome discrimination, and it is about practices with disparate impacts on different classes. 
Next, we will review several fairness notions in four major categories on awareness, individual fairness, group fairness, and counterfactual fairness. Let's start with unawareness. Unawareness is also called blindness or anti-classification. It requires that sensitive attributes, such as gender in our loan granting example, are not explicitly used in the decision process. In this case, given the same X, the score for a male applicant and a female applicant will be the same. And the decision L on a male application and a female application will be the same as well because it is only a function of S and S is not dependent of A. Unawareness ensures that sensitive attributes do not explicitly affect the decision and therefore there is no disparate treatment. However, algorithms and decision-making processes that satisfy the unawareness requirement often lead to different outcomes across groups, creating disparate impact. This is because sensitive attributes are usually correlated with other features. So even though the sensitive attributes are not explicitly used in the machine learning model, the input features could still carry information about the sensitive attributes. This phenomenon is commonly known as redundant encoding. This particular observation has very important implications. It suggests that removing sensitive attributes from machine learning models may not be sufficient to ensure machine fairness. Individual fairness notions require the decisions to be fair for any pair of individuals. Dwork and others were among the first to popularize this concept. They propose a fairness definition that reflects the idea that similar individuals should be treated similarly. Here is how they define fairness. M is a mapping from individuals to probability distributions over possible outcomes based on their features X. The capital letter D is a distance measure for distributions and the lowercase d is a distance measure for feature vectors. In our loan granting example, this fairness constraint means that if the distance between any two applicants computed under a certain distance measure on x is d, then the distance between their probability of being funded should be at most d. This implies that under individual fairness notions, if two applicants are similar in their observed features, their probability of being funded should be similar. It's important to remember that the validity of this fairness notion depends on the choice of distance metrics. Dwork and others also emphasize that the distance metric D should be task specific. It should measure whether individuals are similar with respect to a certain task. More importantly, the sensitive attributes should not directly or indirectly affect the distance metrics. In most cases, the distance metrics can only approximate rather than capture the ground truths of the relevant construct, such as credit risk. And the quality of the approximation depends on available features. Another implication of individual fairness notions is that a cutoff rule can never be fair. Oftentimes, firms use machine learning algorithms to score individuals and then give uh, favorable decisions to those whose scores are above or below a certain threshold. In our loan granting example, the bank may give loans only to those with credit scores higher than a threshold. Individuals whose scores are just above and just below the threshold are similar, and they should be treated similarly. However, with the cutoff rule, one group is always funded, whereas the other group never is. Therefore, the individual fairness notions require randomized mapping from features to decisions. Although individual fairness notions are simple and intuitive, then ambiguity and uncertainty in distance me measures or metrics and the required randomized mapping really hinder the uh, practical use of such uh, fairness notions. 
how to refine and better formalize the individual fairness notions remains an open question. The third category of fairness notions is group fairness. Group fairness notions require equality in certain statistics across different demographic groups. In contrast to individual fairness notions, group fairness notions do not consider the features of applicants, X, and the mappings from features to decisions. Instead, these notions are defined over certain group statistics that only involve the decision and prediction outcomes and the ground truth label. Let's again take a look at the loan granting example. Recall that the decision L in our setting is whether to give the loan to an applicant, and Y is the performance of the loan or whether the applicant will repay the loan. Y hat is the predicted performance, which means whether the algorithm predicts that the applicant will pay back the loan. And there are four possible combinations of the Y and Y hat values. If the predicted performance and the true performance are both one, it's a true positive. If the predicted performance is one while the true performance is zero, it's a false positive. If the predicted performance and the true performance are both zero, it's a true negative. If the predicted performance is zero while the true performance is one, it's a false negative. The bank will only grant the loan to applicants who are predicted to pay back the loan or those whose y hat equals one. This matrix, which reports the number of instances in each category, is commonly known as a confusion matrix. Next, I'm going to introduce a set of group fairness notions based on this example. Statistical parity is one of the most popular fairness notions in the computer science community. It's also called demographic parity. It requires that individuals from different demographic groups should have an equal chance of being selected for favorable actions, such as being granted a loan. In other words, it requires that decisions and sensitive attributes are independent, or the proportion of individuals with y hat equaling 1 is the same for different demographic groups. It may be desirable to have equal acceptance rates in certain scenarios, such as employment and school admissions, for diversity or affirmative action. Statistical parity is not appropriate in some cases because it ignores individuals' qualifications. When one group has more qualified individuals, Statistical parity requires us to reject qualified individuals from this group and approved unqualified individuals from the other group. It's questionable whether this approach is indeed fair and often is not aligned with our goals in decision making. Because of the conceptual flaws in statistical parity and its variants, Several new group fairness notions have been proposed in recent years. And these fairness notions consider not only the final decision L, but also the true label Y. The underlying idea is that the label Y can serve as the ground truth of qualification. Equal opportunity is another popular group fairness notion. The underlying idea is that qualified individuals should have an equal opportunity to obtain favorable outcomes, regardless of their sensitive attributes. In our example, this means that the probability of receiving the loans should be the same for applicants who will actually repay in both male and female groups. That is, conditional on y equaling 1 the probability of receiving a positive decision is the same for the male and female groups. Because the bank will grant loans to individuals who are predicted to repay, L equaling 1 is equivalent to white hat equaling 1, so essentially equal opportunity requires the same true positive rate in different demographic groups. 
Equal opportunity we saw on the previous slide requires that we should correctly identify qualified applicants and approve them at the same rate in both demographic groups. It does not specify any requirement on decisions for applicants who are not qualified. Equalized odds is a related but stronger fairness notion. It requires that not only qualified individuals, but also unqualified individuals should have the same rate of being selected in different demographic groups. In other words, it requires both the same true positive rate and the same false positive rate. Equal opportunity and equalized odds address some key drawbacks of statistical parity. First, they take individuals' qualifications into consideration. When one demographic group has both more qualified individuals and more approved individuals, it's no longer ambiguous whether the decisions are biased or justifiable under these two fairness notions. Second, these two fairness notions are often aligned with decision makers' utility goals. Accepting all the qualified individuals and rejecting all the non-qualified individuals maximizes a decision maker's utility but violates statistical parity when uh, proportions of qualified individuals in different demographic groups are not equal. However, equal opportunity and equalized odds are always satisfied under perfect prediction and therefore could potentially motivate the decision makers to improve prediction performance, especially for the group with lower prediction accuracy, which is oftentimes the minority group and therefore improve its welfare. Balance for positive class and balance for negative class reflect ideas similar to those of equal opportunity and equalized odds. But instead of measuring distributions of final decisions, they focus on the algorithm produced scores. Balance for positive class requires the average scores of the individuals in a positive class to be the same across all demographic groups. Here, positive class is the class of individuals with Y equaling 1 or those who will repay the loan. In our loan granting example, this means that the scores that the machine learning algorithm produces should have the same expected value for males who will repay and females who will repay. Similarly, balance for negative class requires the average scores of the individuals in the negative class to be the same across all demographic groups. That is, the algorithm produced scores in our loan granting example should have the same expected value for males who will not repay and females who will not repay. Note that these two fairness notions are defined over the predicted scores, and although the underlying ideas are similar to those behind equal opportunity and equalized odds, there's no clear mapping among these notions because the mapping from predicted scores to final decisions is quite flexible. The previous four fairness notions focus on the predicted outcomes or scores for individuals with certain actual outcomes. The next two fairness notions are the opposite. They evaluate the actual outcomes for individuals with certain predicted outcomes or scores. Predictive parity requires that the proportions of positive instances among the approved individuals are the same across demographic groups. That's basically the number of true positive instances divided by the total number of positive instances. In our loan granting example, this means that male applicants who are approved for loans and female applicants who are approved for loans should have the same payback rate. Predicted parity is equivalent to equal positive predicted value or equal precision across different demographic groups. In the same spirit, calibration requires that the proportion of positive instances among individuals with the same predicted scores are the same across all demographic groups. 
in our loan granting example, this means that the male applicants and female applicants with the same predicted scores should have the same payback rate, which can be expressed using this equation here. There has been a growing body of literature on group fairness definitions, partly because they are simple and intuitive and can be easily verified without access to the algorithm or imposing assumptions on the data. In the tutorial chapter, we briefly review a few other group fairness notions. In the interest of time, I will not discuss them here. However, group fairness notions cannot ensure fairness at the individual level, as they only put constraints on group level statistics. It's also important to note the inherent conflicts of different group fairness notions. There have been multiple studies showing the incompatibility of different group fairness notions. Counterfactual fairness notions take a different approach to measuring fairness in algorithm-based decisions. It's based on the question, what would the decision be if the applicant were in a different demographic group? Counterfactual fairness requires that the decision remains unchanged in a counterfactual world in which the individual has a different sensitive attribute value. It's important to note that the sensitive attribute A may causally affect some features in X. Therefore, unawareness, the strategy of excluding the sensitive attribute from the inputs, cannot guarantee counterfactual fairness because the changes in other features resulting from the change in the sensitive attribute could possibly change the decisions. Therefore, the evaluation of counterfactual fairness depends on a set of causal assumptions, which can be summarized in a causal graph. The graph specifies how variables affect each other. If we use x sub g prime to denote the features of the applicant in a counterfactual world where the sensitive feature is flipped under causal graph G, counterfactual fairness requires the decisions to be the same in the actual world and in a counterfactual world. Counterfactual fairness notions are individual level definitions. They evaluate whether the decision for an individual is fair by comparing the decisions in the actual world and in the counterfactual world. The causal perspective makes counterfactual fairness notions attractive However, this particular feature also makes counterfactual fairness notions hard to implement. It's usually difficult, if not impossible, to verify a causal graph. Although a number of fairness notions have been clearly defined, the detection of algorithmic bias is not as straightforward as it may appear. A key challenge with identifying discrimination in algorithm is that the exact algorithm used to make a decision is often not available to investigators. Also, technical reasons related to interpretability limit an investigator's ability to identify systematic discrimination through a direct analysis of algorithms. Therefore, investigators typically rely on analyzing the outcomes of algorithms to identify potential discrimination. So next, I will talk about some common strategies for identifying algorithmic bias. One of the earliest methods of detecting bias is comparing the selection rates of different groups. If the selection rate for one group is much lower than others, we say this group of individuals is being discriminated against. This method corresponds to the concept of statistical parity, and it's widely used in our society. For example, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uses a so-called four-fifths rule, or 80% rule, to determine if there is discrimination. The rule requires the selection rate of a protected group to be no less than 80% of the selection rate of a regular group. One assumption the four-fifths test relies on is that the two groups are similar in terms of the proportion of qualified members. However, it's possible that one group may have more qualified members. In our loan granting example, 
it's possible that more male applicants than female applicants will repay the loans. In this case, male applicants may have a higher approval rate even in the absence of discrimination. Several statistical tests have been proposed to separate the difference in group composition and discrimination, which I will discuss in the next few slides. The most widely used statistical test for discrimination is regression analysis. In this analysis, we can control for the variables that capture underlying risk to account for group composition and use sensitive attributes to predict the likelihood of selection. If the regression is correctly specified, a significant non-zero coefficient for the sensitive attribute is viewed as the evidence for discrimination. However, convincingly claiming discrimination with regression analysis is difficult because it's extremely difficult to identify the causal effects of sensitive attributes on decisions. Whether a regression analysis correctly identifies discrimination crucially depends on specification of the regression. There are two important statistical limitations that can bias the results. They are omitted variable bias and included variable bias. Omitted variable bias is a well-known problem in econometric analysis. Omitting variables that affects the dependent variable and independent variables in a regression can lead to bias in the estimation of the coefficients. The same logic applies here. For instance, in the loan granting example, a decision maker may use payment history, which correlates with gender, in making loan granting decisions. If the investigator does not include payment history in his regression, he may incorrectly conclude that the decision maker discriminates based on gender. Another potential problem is included variable bias. It occurs when the investigator inappropriately includes non-justified variables that may be correlated with the protected attributes into the regression. An extreme example is including the presence of facial hair in the algorithm used for hiring purposes. The presence of facial hair is highly correlated with gender and in itself should have no impact on hiring decisions. Including it in the regression would incorrectly reduce the effect of gender in the regression. Oftentimes, we cannot observe all the factors the decision makers has taken into consideration. Researchers have proposed a novel bias detection method called outcome test to overcome this issue. For instance, in the loan granting example, even if minorities are less creditworthy than the majorities, the minorities who are granted loans, absent discrimination, should still be found to repay their loans at the same rate as majorities who are granted loans. This method corresponds to the fairness notion of predictive parity that I described earlier. If minorities have a higher repayment rate than uh, the majorities, this suggests that the decision makers apply a double standard granting loans only to exceptionally qualified minorities. However, outcome tests are known to suffer from inframarginality problem. It means that even if there is no discrimination, the repayment rates of loan recipients in different demographic groups may still differ because of their different underlying risk distributions. The inframarginality problem occurs because in the outcome tests, we compare the average performance of all individuals from the two groups who are beyond the threshold. However, to check whether a decision maker applies the same standard to different groups, we should really compare the performance of only individuals who are at the margin or just past the threshold. Recently, some research has proposed a threshold test that mitigates the problem of inframarginality by jointly estimating decision thresholds and risk distributions. Another approach that can be applied to detect algorithmic discrimination is benchmarking. 
The idea is that the outcome distributions and the benchmark population should be the same. For example, to figure out whether the race of drivers plays a role in who police stop, researchers need to find the at-risk population in situations where race was unlikely to play a role in their identification of being at risk. A possible benchmark population in this example are traffic tickets or stops based on radars and cameras. However, establishing the right benchmark population is challenging. In the previous example, the traffic tickets or stops based on radars and cameras may not be the right benchmark if the race composition of commuters in places where the radars and cameras are deployed is different from places where police are physically present. To sum up, detecting algorithmic bias is a challenging problem. Although researchers have made progress on this issue, a cost-efficient method is still missing. Experiments are one potential way in which algorithmic discrimination can be more cleanly studied. However, experiments are often quite costly and may not be uh, always feasible. It's also important to understand why machine learning algorithms may exhibit bias. The general view is that an algorithm itself is not intentionally designed to be biased, but it may pick up and amplify biases in the input data. Machine learning algorithms are designed to find statistical correlations in the data. Therefore, if the input data carry social biases, the trend algorithm is likely to reflect the same biases. So next, I will discuss how input data could be biased and why that may cause algorithmic bias. Bias may exist in the predictive labels, which are used as the ground truths for the predictive objectives in training machine learning algorithms. If the labels are biased, then the trend algorithms will try to mimic such biases. The biases in labels can come from various sources. First, when the labels are historical human decisions, the biases may come from human decision makers. In a long granting example, if the machine learning algorithm is trained to predict who should be approved based on historical approval decisions rather than historical loan outcomes, then the machine prediction may be encoded with biases in past human decisions. Second, the biases may be introduced in the manual labeling process. In many machine learning tasks, labels are not directly available, and we may hire people, for example, from Amazon Mechanical Turk, to manually label some instances. In this case, the label of bias encoded in the labels depends on individual labelers. Third, the biases in labels may arise in the choice of proxies for the ground truths. Obmeyer and others provide a good example of such biased labels. They found significant racial bias in a commercial prediction algorithm that is widely used in the healthcare industry. At the same level of predicted risk, black patients are much sicker than white patients in reality. They explore the mechanisms of the bias and realize that the predictive objective of the algorithm is healthcare costs instead of severity of illness. Although the cost is correlated with illness severity, it does not account for the unequal access to healthcare resources. Rather than be less sick, some patients have low healthcare costs because they have limited access to medical treatment. In this case, the algorithm is provided biased objectives, and it is not surprising that its outputs are biased in the similar way. Another important cause of algorithmic bias is the imbalanced representation of different demographic groups. The protected groups, such as racial minorities and women, are usually underrepresented in data used to train the machine learning algorithms for various reasons. First, some protected groups, such as racial minorities, by definition, have lower populations compared with regular groups. Second, in many cases, training data are samples selected by previous decisions. 
For example, in making the loan granting decision, we train a machine learning algorithm that predicts loan performance based on historical loan performance. Note that we do not observe performance for the loans that have not been approved. Therefore, our training data set consists of approved loans only. If females have been discriminated against in the previous loan approval decisions, then they will be underrepresented in the data. There may also be self-selection. Even if previous decisions are completely fair, people who never apply for loans could not be approved and therefore would not be included in the data used to train the algorithms. How does imbalanced representation bias algorithm predictions? Imbalanced representation means we have fewer observations for the protected groups compared with other groups. So the predictions for the protected group may be less accurate. In reality, cultural differences and social inequality can lead to that different demographic groups usually have different statistical patterns in the observed features and the prediction objectives. And what algorithm learns from one group may not be applicable to another. When a group-blind algorithm is trained to minimize overall errors, it will fit the majority group when it's not flexible enough to fit all the groups. Therefore, predictions for the minority group individuals are less accurate. Sometimes, overrepresentation of protected groups could also be a problem. For example, police may patrol areas uh, more often than others, and as a result, uh, catch more crimes in the former areas. In historical crime data, these areas are overrepresented. It's not hard to imagine that if we build a machine learning algorithm to predict the crime rate, these areas will have significantly higher crime risk, even if the actual crime rate is equal to or even lower than other areas. Another potential source of algorithmic bias is data quality disparity. The input data may be less complete, accurate, or timely in protected groups. This means there could be more noise in input features for people in protected groups, which makes prediction more difficult for these people. The predictiveness of the same feature may be different across demographic groups too. For example, education is usually an important factor used to distinguish competent job applicants from incompetent ones. The experience of attending a reputable university may help us draw distinctions among people in certain demogra uh, demographic groups, but it may be less useful in the protected groups if most of the people in these groups have no access to reputable universities regardless of their competency level. Both type of data quality disparity can lead to less accurate predictions for protected group individuals and result in biased decisions. Now we know why machine learning algorithms may be biased, a natural follow-up question is how to deal with algorithmic bias. A number of methods have been proposed to mitigate algorithmic bias problems. These correction methods generally fall into one of the following three categories. They are pre-processing, adding fairness constraints, and post-processing. Data pre-processing aims to remove or mitigate potential bias by transforming data so that it contains no information about sensitive attributes, but retains the maximum possible task-relevant information. Recall that even when sensitive attributes are not included in the input features, algorithms can still infer sensitive attributes from other features because of redundant encoding. Therefore, the transformed fair representations of the original data need to be statistically independent of the sensitive attributes. There are two approaches to achieve this. One approach is to map the input features to a space orthogonal to the sensitive features before feeding them into the machine learning algorithm. Another approach is adversarial learning. The basic framework is to simultaneously learn a predictor and the adversary in a neural network. The predictor tries to predict the labels 
and the adversary tries to model the sensitive attributes. The goal is to maximize the predictor's uh, ability to correctly predict the labels, while minimizing the adversary's ability to predict the sensitive attributes. Another approach of correction is to add fairness constraints while training machine learning algorithms. The idea is very simple. We can add a penalty term that measures the disparity into the objective function of the machine learning algorithm. As a result, while the algorithm searches for parameters that minimize prediction errors, it also balances the disparity in the statistics of interest. The third approach is to post-process prediction results. This approach is particularly useful in settings where machine learning algorithms and input data are not available. In these cases, we can still try to correct algorithmic bias by processing final prediction results. For example, suppose we want to achieve equal opportunity in the loan granting example. Because of sampling bias and data quality disparity, our predictions of loan performance are worse for females. Therefore, if we apply the same threshold to both males and females, and only approve loans for applicants whose predicted probability of repayment is higher than the threshold, we will end up approving a lower percentage of females who will actually repay. In this case, we can lower the threshold for females such that the true positive rate of the female group equals that of the male group. Although this approach is simple and intuitive, a meaningful solution does not always exist. For instance, if we aim to achieve equalized odds, we may not have the feasible solution when prediction accuracy differs too much for different demogra demographic groups, or uh, the only feasible solution may not be sensible. So far, we have been focusing on the technical aspect of fair machine learning. As I have alluded to you at the beginning of the presentation, it's important to account for agents' reactions to any imposed fairness constraints when studying the policy implications of these fairness constraints. Economic modeling and social science methods would be useful to study agents' strategic behavior and gain the holistic view of the effect of imposing certain fairness notions. Economists are often interested in whether algorithms can improve the status quo. If a decision is not made by the machine, it will most likely be made by a human. Therefore, it makes sense to benchmark algorithms against human judgments. However, it's not as easy to achieve a fair comparison between human and algorithm as it may appear. One significant challenge is the selective labels problem in the data, which means that the process generates only a partial labeling of the instances and the decision maker's choices determine which instances have labels. Lacaraju and others propose a contraction algorithm to deal with the selective label problem. And a few studies have successfully applied this method to their respective contests. These studies provide evidence that algorithms can potentially improve upon human decisions in the context of billing decisions, consumer lending, and P2P lending. In most technical research on algorithmic bias, the data used to train and test the algorithm are treated as given. When proposing new fairness notions and policy changes, the behavior of agents who use the algorithm or those who are subject to the algorithm is often assumed to remain the same. However, in reality, agents are likely to strategically react to changes in the algorithm. Assuming away agents' strategic reactions may lead to an incorrect or misleading conclusion. For example, Fu and others consider decision makers' incentive to invest in learning and show that new notions of machine fairness, such as equal opportunity, can make everyone worse off, including the very group they try to protect. This is because reinforcing fairness in the output of the algorithm can negatively affect the benefits from the algorithm. 
Compared with current law, the requirement of equal opportunity further reduces the benefit from a more accurate algorithm for a firm. As a result, the firm may reduce the uh, investment in learning and grant fewer loans to both protected group individuals and regular group individuals. Lambridge and Tucker conducted a field test and showed that the stern ads are shown more often to men than to women. They found that this difference was not driven by the algorithm learning from biased data, but by the economics of ad delivery. Women are less likely to see these ads for stern jobs because ad auctions for female eyeballs attract more bidders and thus have higher clearing prices. Therefore, an algorithm that optimizes cost effectiveness will deliver ads that were intended to be gender neutral in an apparently discriminatory manner. Some researchers suggest that the use of algorithms can facilitate collusion, especially in a pricing contest. However, such collusion does not always increase prices. It could lead to higher or lower prices in different settings. Algorithmic transparency has been in increasing demand to combat algorithmic bias and discrimination. However, firms are reluctant to publish their algorithms, and one of their major concerns is that once they do that, users can game the system. Wan and others studied how strategic individuals react when a firm makes its hiring algorithm transparent. They show that under some conditions, the firm can be strictly better off by making the algorithm transparent. In their model, a firm uses an algorithm to classify applicants into a high type and a low type. The input of the algorithm contains a set of causal features and a set of correlational features. Causal features are costly to improve and have a causal impact on applicants' ability and correlational features are costless to improve, but they are correlated with unobservable causal features and therefore are predictive of applicants' ability. However, manipulating correlational features does not affect an applicant's ability. They show that although algorithmic transparency makes it possible for the low-type applicants to game on the correlational features, it may intensify individuals' competition along the causal dimensions. The more intense competition has two effects. The first effect is that there will be a more clear separation between the high-type and the low-type applicants on the causal dimensions. And the second effect is that individuals' average performance on the causal dimensions and their productivity will also increase. When these two positive effects dominate the negative effects of user gaming, the firm is better off making the algorithm transparent. Finally, it's worth mentioning that there have been calls for regulations that reconcile different fairness notions and establish practice standards. Several organizations and companies have published guidelines for implementing trustworthy and ethical AI with fairness as an essential component. Notable examples include the European Ethics Guidelines for Trustworthy AI, the White House Guidance for Regulation of Artificial Intelligence Applications, and Google's Perspectives on Issues in AI Governance. These guidelines recognize the importance of identifying and mitigating algorithmic bias, and some provide practical advice on how to design fairness-aware algorithms. There have also been attempts to formalize anti-algorithmic bias practice into law, and here are some examples of such attempts. The New York City Council passed a local law in, re in relation to automated decision systems used by agencies. It requires the creation of a task force to monitor agency automated decision systems and provide recommendations. There are also federal level and state level bills that have been put forward to address concerns about the accuracy, fairness, and security of algorithms. To conclude, in this tutorial, we reviewed a number of fairness notions that have been proposed in the fair machine learning literature. 
Each fairness notion takes a particular perspective and represents a specific fairness consideration. Some fairness notions are incompatible with each other. Therefore, it's important to determine the most significant fairness concerns on a case-by-case -case basis. There may be an opportunity to use an economic framework to guide the choice of fairness notions. We also reviewed existing methods for bias detection and highlighted the challenge in detecting bias in opaque algorithms without knowing either how the algorithm works or the ground truth in the population. We talked about potential sources of algorithmic bias, as well as three categories of methods for removing or reducing bias and their respective advantages and limitations. Finally, we reviewed the literature that looks at algorithmic bias through an economic lens. We argue that it's important to account for agents' reactions to any imposed fairness constraints when studying the policy implications of fairness notions. Economic modeling would be useful to study agents' strategic reactions and gain a holistic view of the effects of imposing fairness notions. That's all for this presentation. Thank you for your attention.